I think. Thank you, Audrey. All right, so welcome again to Data for Nonprofit Advocacy. Uh, today, uh, we're just going to go over um, our agenda for today so you know where we're going. Um, and again, the topic is data for nonprofit advocacy. So we thought we'd start with kind of a broad overview of what is nonprofit advocacy, why do we need it, um, and we'll talk about kind of different types of advocacy you might encounter and uh, some of the rules and regulations around that. And then Araceli will uh, tell us more about the different levels of nonprofit advocacy and how um, you might make decisions around um, when to engage at different levels. Um, and also share some other kind of tips and tricks on how to engage in the policy process. And then finally, Audrey will um, tell us more about how to kind of prepare and use your data for advocacy and how to start creating an advocacy plan. Are there any questions before we get started? Oh, and um, as a reminder, we, um, the Capacity Collective created um, a bunch of what we call empower tools. And these are just kind of free one page front and back handouts on different aspects of data. Um, so the training that we're presenting today is kind of based um, on the series of four empower tools that we made on nonprofit advocacy. So if you're interested in um, learning a little bit more or having kind of a handout, you can find those empower tools on our website, which I think uh, someone just shared the link to that in our chat. Um, we'll also make sure to send these out to you after the training as well. And then um, if you see kind of in the bottom right hand corner of our slides um, going forward, uh, we'll have the name of the Empower tool if that slide can correspond so you'll know what to refer to if you're looking for that information. Right, so um, we'll start now with a kind of nonprofit advocacy overview and first kind of offer a definition of what is nonprofit advocacy. Um, I think simply put, nonprofit advocacy is any deliberate effort by a nonprofit organization to directly or indirectly influence public policy. Um, so you can think of that as really any activity that helps elevate the voice of the organization or individuals and groups um, involved in the organization with policymakers or the public. Uh, you might be engaging in direct advocacy and that means directly communicating with uh, elected officials on certain issues or you might be engaging in indirect advocacy where your audience is more the public or community members or other organization leaders. And we'll talk a little bit more about the you know, difference between the two and different types of advocacy a little bit later. So why do we need advocacy? Um, and specifically, why is it important for nonprofits to engage in advocacy? Because you know, some people might say that nonprofits do enough, right? Like they provide all these programs and services and that's what they should focus on. And, and some people might say their nonprofit just doesn't have the capacity to do advocacy work. So why like specifically is it important for nonprofits to do advocacy? Um, and one reason is to advance your program's mission and vision. Um, hopefully support that with quality data. Uh, so for example, your organization's mission might be to support healthy parent-child relationships. And you do that through your programs, your home visiting programs, for example. Um, but you might also have an advocacy goal to support a paid family leave policy. And even though that's not directly related to your programs, it is still aligned with your mission and um, helping to pass 
something like that would be another way to advance your mission and support the community you serve in a kind of larger scale. Um, another reason you might engage in advocacy is to increase your funding sources, which I'm sure all of us here have um, had to engage with at some point. It's kind of just a practical reality of working in nonprofits and that you're often having to advocate for more funding, whether that be with you know, a government funder or private kind of foundations. Um, next, um, we have kind of help decision makers make the right choices for your communities and give power and agency back to the people most affected. So I think often, um, I think many people think of elected officials as kind of powerful people and they have all this you know, information at their disposal, but really um, often people with decision-making power in government or even you know, people who lead foundations and things like that aren't really experts on the things that they make policy on, um, and they aren't experts on the kind of communities that their policy or their funding affects. So they really rely on other people to educate them and even help them write policy. So nonprofits are really like uniquely positioned to engage in advocacy kind of given you know, that they're mission-driven organizations that um, are usually centered around social change. Um, they're well kind of respected in their communities and have you know, expertise in issues um, and kind of lived experience in communities that their representatives might not. So you really have kind of a new, unique strength um, and power in being able to um, connect with communities and amplify their voices as well. In, with advocacy work. And um, lastly here, we have kind of affect systemic change and address root causes of issues affecting communities. Um, and that kind of gets back to our first point about your program's mission or your organization's mission in that, um, you know, not all the time, but many nonprofits are kind of dealing with problems that, um, Kind of treating problems as they occur or after they occur, but um, really want to um, or ideally address root causes and prevent problems before they occur. And that is ultimately kind of the, the dream, the goal for, for many of us kind of in this field. So um, this is definitely not a full list of all the reasons you might engage in advocacy, but um, I think it's really important for a lot of us in our work to like really connect to the why, like why do we do this work? So um, I'd love to hear from some of you if you have kind of any other reasons that you don't see here about why you might wanna engage in advocacy work or if any of these reasons really resonate with you and you wanna share more about that, we'd love to hear from you either in the chat again or feel free to unmute. Um, I feel like, hi, this is Rebecca. Um, I feel like the last two are really resonating with me in the work I do um, in Skyway. Um, we really advocate uh, to affect change in a lot of the systems that have kept our community kind of unresourced and underrepresented. So it's a, it's a really powerful way to bring not only attention, but funding and resources. Um, and then that, that next one up that gives the power and agency back to the people most affected is another really central piece for us, which is um, really exciting to be able to empower residents with knowledge and capacity to be able to continue that work. Um, so those two are really, really resonating for me. Well, thank you for sharing. It looks like 
in the chat, Jamie also shared that all of these reasons resonate with me, giving power and agency back stands out and effective system change and root causes and prevention of continued harm. Sounds like we're in agreement here. Um, what I can say for me, all the reason resonates um, with the mission of the organization, all of that. But for me, advocacy um, means a lot for my community first, because um, they have no voice unless we go to them and hear them, right? And they will at least at that level to represent their needs to, to the organization and be able to, to, to go around or fund the needs or uh, solution or whatever it's gonna be. But it's very important for me to see how the community can be in a need. We need people that can be like a real representative of the community to the organization. And therefore, of course, the organization gonna go up in the level to get the funding to know how to go back to them. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. That's a really great point. And that you know, nonprofits, especially community community-based organizations, really have that kind of connection with the people they serve um, and work with. That you know, often people who are have power or decision-making power, you know, don't really have that connection and don't really understand the needs in the way that, that you might be able to. All right, we'll keep going here. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about different types of advocacy. So I'll share kind of three broad kind of categories that people kind of often group advocacy activities into. Um, the first one is community advocacy, um, which sometimes might be referred to organ as organizing or community organizing. And that's um, really about kind of unifying people around you know, a common cause. Uh, so you might be working directly with community members, the public, um, other organizations who share your mission and goals. And um, the goal here is often to educate the public around an issue and engage them um, around that issue and build and maintain coalitions. So it's usually, um, the goal here is to take collective action. Um, it might take form um, of some kind of disruptive action, like a protest or boycott, um, but it might also just be like a, an email campaign to get you know, the public to contact their representatives. And it's, it's often kind of thought of as something that um, is needed to kind of support other types of advocacy as well, which we'll talk about. Um, the second type here is legal advocacy, which um, are intentional attempts to affect policy change through the court system. So the audience here would be your people in the legal field, courts, judges, lawyers, and the goal uh, might be to support um, the public interest in a court case, maybe provide expert testimony in a case um, or educate the legal field on an issue. Um, and if you're know, familiar with the ACLU, that's they're a great example of legal advocacy where they're kind of involved, of course, in many court cases, but they also, um, a lot of their work is kind of putting out papers and things to kind of educate uh, the legal field and also the kind of broader community. Um, the third main type of advocacy, which uh, we'll be talking a lot about today, is lobbying. And that is kind of intentional attempts to influence legislation, um, usually directly. So your audience here would be public officials, elected officials, um, really at any level of government. And the goal would be to usually influence a specific piece of legislation. Um, and kind of telling policymakers how they should change policy. Um, that usually happens 
while legislation is in debate. Any questions on these? And uh, so we just talked about kind of three three ways to kind of categorize advocacy, uh, legal, community, and lobbying. And um, on this slide, we're gonna talk a little bit about direct versus indirect advocacy. And uh, just to kind of clarify, we're not necessarily talking about different types of activities here. They're kind of the same advocacy activities that we just um, talked about, but it is another way to kind of think about and categorize um, advocacy work. Um, so you might hear people talking about it um, in this way and kind of using these terms. So I wanted to go over that a little bit here. So direct advocacy um, is what we were just talking about with lobbying. Um, so you might hear it be referred to as direct lobbying. And that's, again, where you're going to attempt to influence legislation by like directly communicating with um, an elected official or someone who participates in kind of making policy. Um, that might kind of take the form of meetings with policymakers. Um, you might, you know, meet with them one-on-one -on -one or meet with someone who works in their office. Um, it could be doing something like providing public testimony at a council hearing or a committee meeting. And um, it might also look like sending a letter to a policymaker that comes directly from your organization. Uh, so these are all kind of examples of direct lobbying. Um, indirect advocacy, uh, generally kind of encompasses the other two categories we just talked about on the last slide. So legal and community advocacy. Um, sometimes you might um, hear it um, being referred to as grassroots lobbying. And um, that means you're really trying to like influence legislation by engaging the public. So often that might mean kind of running an email campaign or a phone call kind of campaign. I'm sure many of you have been asked or um, maybe even organized some of these campaigns, um, been asked to like call your legislature about a certain issue. Um, it could be like activities that you're doing to educate the public on an issue. Um, it might mean co-creating policy solutions. So, um, some organizations, you know, might work together to like write policy and help if, um, elected officials kind of write and pass policy. Um, and it could be also like activities like voter registration, so like helping your clients um, register to vote is an example of indirect advocacy. Um, so these are just a few examples. Does anyone have experience with any of these forms of advocacy or? Is there anything kind of missing from the list that you would like to add? That is all right. Feel free to chime in later in the chat if you think of anything. But yeah, really, advocacy can take um, a lot of forms. There, like our you know protests, you know collective action, like we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, it might happen through the media. You could you know write an op-ed and submit it to a newspaper. That's another form of advocacy. So. Um, I think those are all kind of great options and things that you could do as an individual or as an organization. Um, but for the most part, um, the rest of our presentation will be focusing a little bit more on um, lobbying and kind of different levels of government.
Um, yeah, so like I said, we are going to be talking a lot about activities that involve lobbying your elected officials. Um, and often people who are kind of in and around nonprofits aren't really sure about that. Like, are we actually allowed to do lobbying? Is that legal? Um, and there are often kind of misconceptions about that. But um, to clear that up, um, the answer is yes. All nonprofits can get involved in advocacy work, including direct lobbying, with some limits, which we'll talk about. Uh, but main thing to remember is, as a nonprofit, you definitely can do direct lobbying, um, and that means when you're communicating directly with an elected official. Um, and the, the limits are, are kind of put on by the IRS, um, which says that the 501c3, a nonprofit organization, may not attempt to influence legislation as a substantial part of its activities, and it may not participate in any campaign activity for or against political candidates. So um, I know like information from the IRS isn't super exciting, uh, but I think Often in nonprofits, there are kind of misconceptions and kind of confusion around the rules and regulations um, that you know make people kind of hesitant to participate in advocacy, especially in lobbying work, and um, that can often like stall progress on advocacy activities. So um, this you know may or may not be the case for any of you, but um, if you know you ever see this come up or get you know any kind of pushback around um, advocacy activities, I think um, it's helpful to kind of have this information in your back pocket and be able to say, actually, like we can do this, and here's why it's okay. So um, we won't get too far into like the details of this, but I um, just want to make sure that we can clarify what this really means. So. Um, what are some of the limits that the IRS puts on nonprofit advocacy and what's allowed and not allowed? Um, so, like um, we mentioned just now, direct lobbying is definitely allowed um, as long as it's not a substantial part of your activities, which we'll um, talk about on the next slide. And you are allowed to do voter education as long as it's nonpartisan, meaning you're not um, it's not connected to a political party, and you're allowed to do get out the vote activities, so like helping clients get registered to vote, um, as long as you're not telling them who to vote for. And on the flip side of that, what is not allowed is in campaigning for or against a political candidate or party. Um, or contributing money to a political campaign. So um, you really like the main takeaway is that you can definitely do direct lobbying with you know officials who are already elected. But if someone is a political candidate and they're still running a campaign, it's really best not to like get involved um, or do anything that might be seen as partisan. Um, and the other part of, of the quote from the IRS uh, was that there are um, limits to lobbying activities and it can't be a substantial part of your activities. Um, so what, what does that really mean? Um, the IRS doesn't actually define what substantial means. Um, in general, it just kind of means that lobbying can't be the main thing that your organization does if you're going to keep your nonprofit status. Um, and it's kind of about how much money you spend on lobbying activities. So for the most part, um, organizations that are, you know, pretty small, and you're not kind of hiring someone to specifically do advocacy work, um, that's not going to be an issue, you're probably never going to get to the point where it's a substantial part of your spending. But um, if that does happen, or if there's anyone at the organization who's kind of nervous about that, there is 
Um, something you can do called taking the H election, which is, it's just like a short tax form. And if a nonprofit files that, it tells you exactly how much um, you can spend on lobbying. Um, and it's just, not sure why they make it so confusing, but if you fill out this form, it just gives you um, guidance on like what percentage of your budget you can spend on lobbying. Um, whereas if you don't, it just kind of gives you this vague guidance of substantial part. But really the important thing to remember is just to track your organization's lobbying activities. Um, and for the most part, if you're not like a lobbying organization, that's not the main thing you do. It's probably not going to be an issue for you. Are there any questions about this? I have a question. Um, when, when they're when they're speaking about um, limits on nonprofit advocacy, does that include like um, salaries? You know, like time. Like, how does that fit in there? Not just like expenses. Like, how it seems like it could get a little bit hazy. How many hours someone would spend, um, and then how that salary could add to reaching that cap. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, from, from my understanding, the, the issue is with direct lobbying. So it's the time that anyone is being paid to kind of directly communicate with um, and lobby elected officials. So if someone is paid at your organization to do that work specifically, that you know, definitely should be tracked um, and their salary would count towards those expenditures. But um, say you're, you have volunteers kind of doing some of that work, like if your board members are volunteers um, and they take meetings with um, elected officials, that's not an expenditure, right? You're not spending any money on it. And if you're asking, you know, your community, you know, members of the public to send emails or make phone calls. That's also not like a direct lobbying expenditure. So it kind of depends on, on what exactly you're doing. Um, and the main thing to focus on is kind of to track your direct lobbying expenses. Um, and also I do kind of whoever is in charge of that, like your finance person um, should be you know, the person to kind of like provide like the final guidance on that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so if there aren't any other questions, we're just gonna um, do a quick poll. And that should pop up on your screen there. All right, I think everyone had a chance to answer the question. So I'm gonna share the results. And yeah, 100% of you got the right answer. So yes, supporting a mayoral candidate selection campaign would not be allowed, but all the other activities are definitely allowed for a nonprofit.
Okay, so uh, next I'm going to throw it to our Sally to talk about levels of nonprofit advocacy. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about different levels of government uh, with nonprofit advocacy to get us started here. Um, so I'm going to be specifically talking about four different ones. The first one that we have is the city level. So I'll be using um, local uh, governments from Washington state to kind of exa uh, uses examples for this. So um, the Seattle City Council is responsible for approving a city's budget, um, developing policies to promote the health and safety of the residents um, in the city. Um, legislation topics could include, you know, access to affordable childcare, funding for quality early learning opportunities, um, different ways of assessing family needs in the community and much more. Um, the next level I'll talk about is the county level. So for King County, um, they also set policies, enact laws and adopt larger budgets to um, guide services for the within the county. And those can include um, facilitating public outreach and education campaigns, um, connecting families to federal benefits um, and launching larger new youth programs, for instance. And there's some similarities in between city and county councils. So they both have nine members um, that each have four year term limits and the mayors are not part of the councils. Um, and a few ways you can get involved would be to kind of track meetings about certain topics you're interested in or your organization's interested in, um, submitting public comment, or even testifying about an issue. And I'll be speaking more about how to do that a little bit later on. Um, next, we have the state uh, legislators. So for Washington state, they are responsible for once again, you know, making new laws, uh, changing existing laws, imposing taxes, um, writing the state's budget and regulating large state agencies. And the, lastly, I'll talk about national level. Um, so laws and funding for the whole country, um, although it can be a little bit tricky by state um, and the Supreme Court can get involved and has the final decision on these laws. Um, and as a nonprofit, uh, one would need, especially need like a lot of resources to uh, conduct advocacy at a larger scale. So deciding to be active in the legislative process. Um, so there's a few steps that you can kind of take um, to kind of evaluate where your nonprofit is and uh, whether or not it's a good time to step in various levels. Um, so the first thing would be kind of evaluating the capacity your organization has. Do they have the time and resources to get involved in the, this particular topic you're interested in? Next would be partnership. Um, are there other community members or nonprofits um, kind of doing this work already? Um, and you can work as a team with them to kind of get the job done? Or is this something you would have to really lead um, and kind of break ground on and start from scratch? Uh, next, we have the scale, which is most relevant with to the different levels of government. So um, what level of government would be necessary to help the amount of people that are in need within the community that you are serving or the community that you're a part of? And lastly, we have opportunity. So um, there are different policy windows that Audrey will talk about a little bit later, um, but certain chances that come up um, that would be a good start to, uh, or entry point into an advocacy project. So in this next slide, I'm going to be walking us through a little bit of an example of what this would look like with a flow chart. So um, I'll be using the example of paid family leave. Um, so through your work getting paid, um, if you're stepping away to start your family. Um, so first we would take a look um, at the opportunity um, that would come into play. Um, for, for instance, uh, the Seattle City Council a few years ago had two uh, council members that were currently pregnant um, and interested in family leave. So that could be an opportunity to get started on that. Um, 
but sometimes an opportunity isn't present. So you would just start with capacity. So does your organization have the capacity to work on this project right now? Um, and if it's no, then you can kind of save that project um, for later, put it on the back burner, um, or you can adapt to some work that's already been been being done out in the community already and not kind of just lead a whole new project. Um, but if your staff or you yourself from your organization feel like you have enough capacity to do it, um, then you can turn and see what partnerships are out there, what or the other organizations are working on paid family leave or have similar goals that would line up with um, advocating for paid family leave. Um, so if you're kind of doing some research uh, and you don't really see anyone out there that is doing this work, um, that's okay, but it really makes the work easier and more effective if you have at least one partner or a set of community members that can kind of support you in your work. Um, but let's say you do, um, and that's great. Um, so you might be able to partner with them and work on this topic. That's awesome. So you can um, keep on developing your plan and kind of review the scale that you want to go um, go down the path of the different levels of government. Um, so if you want to work at a state level, um, you know, you would need to ensure that you have um, enough resources available because they do take a lot of resources because it's such a um, large area, but it's also connected to a whole bunch of people that you would need votes or support from. Um, and then if it's more city or county level, um, would it um, would it, the benefits outweigh the costs of um, you know introducing community members to this advocacy field or even just putting your staff through this process? Um, and then lastly, here I just have opportunity again. So sometimes the opportunity will present itself at the beginning of deciding to be active in a legislative process or at the end, um, and that can kind of guide you a little bit if um, you're kind of on the fence as to whether or not you want to go for it. Um, so this is just an example of um, what it could look like to decide to be active in the legislative process, but it's very um, circular and even cyclical. So at any point you could be asking yourselves um, some of these questions. Um, does anyone have any questions about deciding to be active in a legislative process? All right. Well, if you do, please do drop it in the chat. Um, so here's just some other examples of some other options um, nonprofits can um, do to be active in the legislative process. Um, the topic uh, for this table is culturally responsive early childhood education. Um, so a different way to look at it would be kind of choosing the level of advocacy um, and kind of pairing that with a resource level. And so a resource level being how many, uh, really tied to the capacity, how many um, resources or how much time um, and money would be necessary to kind of get the job done. Um, so some examples here, if you were to have the city level uh, with something that kind of takes a medium amount of work, um, you know, it might be attending a city council committee meeting and kind of just feeling it out and seeing if there's any culturally responsive um, education policy in the works already. Um, so that wouldn't be testifying, which would be, um, you know, a higher level of resources because you would have to prepare. Um, and a county level would be in front of, um, you know, more people um, about this particular topic. And then lastly, we have state. Uh, so um, it's a, the highest level of government from the, um, aside from national, um, from what we've been talking about, but um, you can also just sign in online and just click a button to support a piece of legislation. And that would be the lowest amount of resources. So those are just some more examples on um, kind of the different levels and the process of decision-making. So, um, we do have a, oh yeah, before a one minute break, we're gonna um, ask another question. So what topics can your organization advocate for? 
Um, so this is based off of, you know, the program and organizational goals you have. Um, and what levels of advocacy feel the most accessible for your programs or organizations at this time? Um, and please do type it in the chat if you're feeling more chatty <laughs> than in, in person. I think for um, our organization, especially because in recent months we've had, well, in the last year, I feel like we've had a lot of engagement with um, the Hispanic community. Um, I think engaging in parent education, not just, well, for everyone, but also specifically for the Hispanic community, because um, we've tried to look it up before as well, and there's not a lot of programs out there in the King County area for that demographic. Um, so I definitely think that's something that would be super useful um, in our area, because that is one of the fastest growing demographics in, I think, the U.S. Very true. Thank you. Yeah, and that ties to the culturally responsive, you know, education. If the education isn't available in the necessary languages, um, that's not going to be very productive for um, the programs out there. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have anything to share? Um, there is this aspect. Um, personally, I, I don't think I'm not sure if I would represent the organization, but it's just my own point of view. Um, because I work with communities, and especially for the people coming from like my background, there's this issue with children, special needs children. So it's, um, I don't know if it's a mental education that we need for the parents, and, but also the process, the navigation process in the US system here, it's very, either very slow or very complicated. You add the language problem and the process time, it just leave a lot of people not being fully served. This is my own opinion. So because we have children, if they are not assessed and um, diagnosed, the early, the better. So if they are not able to access the system and be able to find the need and the problem all the way until late, I think there is a gap there. So this only me, <laughs> so thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. I mean, even if it's your own opinion, I think that's very relevant across different communities. And um, that has me thinking about, you know, how in the school system you um, have to get diagnosed um, at a certain age, um, but possibly there could be some advocacy um, at a school district board meeting about topics like that. Um, and that would be one way that um, you could advocate for your community or your organization. Um, another thing I can add is like, for example, we can have uh, either organization or services that deal with that. For example, assess, screen people and assess that, but we need the, the whole, um, you know, the process from A to Z, a follow-up system. Like, you know, if my organization is not, it just only gonna screen and assess the problem. The next one is, is to refer to a doctor, whatever. There must be a follow-up from A to B, where is what happened between the six months from diagnosis to treatment or what, what is just, I think we may have the pieces, but they're all separated, does not connect to give us the whole um, solution or from need to solution. So, yeah, sorry, thank you. No, thank you. Right. Well, I'm feeling, I'm reading the room and I, oh, yes, we have someone else that I'd like to share. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> All right. Well, let's take our one minute break. <laughs> We're going to have another break 
uh, interspersed here. Um, but I know I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera and we will be back in one minute. All right, everyone, welcome back. Thank you for taking that mini break with us. I know I feel better. <laughs> um, so we will carry on uh, with the content here. So this next section, um, we'll be having some practical um, ways to engage with policy. So uh, how to engage with policy? There are a few ways um, that I have here on how to do that. So you can find and track legislation, um, you can learn how to understand bills, um, and you can participate in the legislative process. Um, and I will be showing you some screenshots and some ways to do that on the Washington State Legislative website. Um, but I will also note that there is a similar website for city and county levels um to do some of these similar things um i will also say that these this next upcoming session begins on january 10th so very soon and it's a short year um so it will last 60 days and it ends march 10th um every other year it the whole session lasts 105 days and it's much longer uh, because they're dealing with um editing the budget yeah so on the home page um, I wanna direct your attention to a few places. Um, so on the left side of the screen, um, that's where you can uh, find your district um, in, in these circles. You could also um, gather some information on different bills or policies or pieces of legislation that are going through um, the legislator or uh, check out agendas, schedules, and calendars. Um, through all of this, uh, you know, COVID and Zooming, um, it is now very accessible to attend meetings um, where your own legislators, um, senators, and Congress people are, um, you know, representing you and speaking on different topics. Um, so it could be very exciting and interesting to even watch the vote and see how the people who represent you are, are voting. Um, so I'll go a little bit more in depth on these three particular ones, but I do recommend kind of checking out the website. There's a lot of good stuff on there. Um, so first I'm gonna talk a little bit about finding your district. Um, so when you click on that, uh, on that little link on the side, it'll take you to this page. And if you just write in either, um, if you wanna know your personal legislators, you can um, put in your home address. Um, or if you are more interested in um, kind of the headquarters of your organization and um, the people who are representing the people who are living the closest to uh, where you work, you can just put in that address and it will zoom in and to that particular district, let you know what district you are from. Um, it'll also tell you who your senators and Congress people are right in that little box. Um, so I, this next part will have you, if you are on a computer or really savvy on your phone and you would like to do this, um, 
we will drop the website in the chat. And uh, please do just, you know, in the chat, drop, um, you know, what district you're from, if you're interested. I really enjoy maps. So this is a fun portion of the presentation for me. <laughs> Um, and while you're doing that, I'll just uh, kind of carry on and talk a little bit more about um, some other aspects of the website. Um, so also on the website, you can explore the agenda schedules and calendars. Um, the first circled uh, section of the table is the session cutoff calendar. Um, so when a bill goes through the legislature, um, there are different uh, kind of milestones or different places, you have to um, get the bill through by a certain time or it is cut off. And um, the technical term is that the bill dies, which I don't really like, it's pretty sad, but the bill is no longer in the running to become a law. Um, and so those particular dates to either get them out of um, the House or the Senate or get them out of a committee, um, are interesting to see um, and kind of to learn more about how bills um, pass through. So that would be the session cutoff calendar to check out. Um, below that, we have the Senate weekly meeting schedules and floor schedules. Um, so that would be a great place to um, kind of check out your personal legislators' um, schedules and show up to some of the meetings. Um, that are open to the public, obviously, um, to kind of get a feel for um, the topics and interests that they have, um, but also whether or not they align with your organization. Um, and then at the bottom uh, section of the table, I just wanted to highlight the Capital Campus activities and events, because um, now more and more of those are, are happening and they used to be um, a very exciting and effective way to advocate physically. Um, and so many topics and um, organizations linked to the topics have particular days um, where different organizations can come and speak directly to decision makers about those topics. And it's really to like, bring awareness, um, but also build community um, in front of the people who are making the decisions. Um, so if you're interested in something like that, that would be a great place to look. Um, and I know that some organizations are leading virtual advocacy days, um, uh, especially last year. Um, but I'm sure there's gonna be some sort of hybrid situation this year. And thank you for those drop in your district in the chat. It's very fun. <laughs> All right, um, lastly here, I'll talk about um, tracking a bill. Um, so when you select bill information, it'll take you to this page. Um, one way to search for a bill would be um, with the little uh, box, the white box here, and you could type in the bill number. Um, most people don't know the bill numbers off the top of their head because there's so many of them um, that go through. And so I would suggest um, on the right hand side here, checking out the bills by sponsor. Um, so a sponsor is a particular decision maker who takes the lead or wants to support particular legislation officially. Um, so you could check out what your representatives are supporting or uh, spearheading. Yes, and I see a question here. What happens if a bill dies? Can it be brought back up during the next legislative session? Does it need a sponsor to bring it back? Great question. Um, yeah, so often bills die a lot and they die for a lot of different reasons. So it is very common for them to be brought up again um, the following legislative session. Um, but it, it really is on a case by case basis and how much advocacy is around a particular bill or if um, a particular decision maker is very passionate about it um, and if they're still in office or not. Um, because um, there is a, a limit to um, both senators and Congress people. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily, so all bills need sponsors. So it doesn't necessarily need to be the same sponsor to bring a bill back or a new iteration of a bill, but each bill does need at least one person. Um, it is very common to have like a whole bunch, even a committee of uh, sponsors, and then a whole other group of support people. Um, 
on just one bill. So um, it's, it's very much like a team effort. It's very rare to have just one single sponsor. Um, sometimes it even happens in pairs um, just so that they can get all the votes necessary to get it through. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, I love, I love an emoji too. We really should be highlighting how much emojis you can, you can use, especially with the update. Oh yeah, that's a good one too. <laughs> okay, um, great. And then the last thing I'll say about um, this tracking a bill page is that you can um, get a personalized list of, of bills that you wanna keep an eye on um, through bill tracking um, and kind of set up an account that you can log into so that you don't have to do it every single time you wanna check on a handful of them. It can be very time consuming. Um, and then I'll go over just kind of what an example of a bill looks like. Um, this bill made it all the way um, to the end and was signed by the governor. Um, I remember when I first learned that, you know, it could, a bill can die multiple steps in all these, you know, the House or the Senate, but it can get to the governor and the governor can just be like, eh, I don't really like it. Or they can veto just a, a really important tiny section of it. Um, but yeah, so here is kind of a general outline of what it looks like um, from start to finish. Um, if you kind of know a bill that you want to learn more about, you can plug it in here and then all of the available documents will be at the bottom that you can check out. Um, and sometimes it's helpful not to read the original bill um, and maybe like some bill reports of um, you know, how people spoke about the bill because it can be very jargony language and difficult to understand. Um, very similar to some legal documents uh, because it is a um, kind of like a draft of a law, a bill. Great. Um, another thing you could do is sign up for email alerts um, and you can kind of tailor it. You can do um, anytime there's an update, you get an email. So that's like the immediate option. You could do kind of like a daily summary email that will come once a day, or you can do kind of a weekly wrap up email situation. Um, and there might be particular committees that are interesting to you. Um, within kind of the, after hearing the organizations um, that you all are, are a part of, I think that the Children, Youth and Families um, Committee would be um, very helpful. Um, also the Housing, Human Services and Veterans. Um, it kind of lumps together three very large topics, um, but the human services really has a lot of key funding um, that might be available to your programs that you might wanna keep an eye on. Great. Um, and as we're wrapping up this section, um, I'll talk a little bit more, more about um, what it looks like to participate in the legislative process um, by delivering testimony. Um, so I'll talk uh, briefly about kind of the different steps to just what that looks like. Um, and then I'll play a short video of um, someone who actually did that. Um, so normally this process is very short and can take 15 minutes or less um, because decision makers don't have that much time. Um, it could be written, virtual or in person. Um, but what is common throughout is that you would want to introduce yourself um, and clearly state your position and why you're there at the beginning and end uh, to kind of remind um, the decision makers where you stand because they can kind of get lost in the middle. Um, the next thing would be to try to connect what you're saying to a personal experience you have, um, especially if you know that you're um, one of the constituents or one of the people living in um, the district of the person that you're speaking to. Um, mentioning that can be very powerful and important because you're um, one of the people who can vote for them um, or your communities are voting for them. Um, you also would want to make an effort to really practice um, and edit down your testimony uh, because there are very uh, strict time limits. And if you are submitting it in uh, written form, you would wanna make sure that you're under a specific word limit because um, it won't be able to be sent um, in particular websites for these specific um, levels of government. Um, Again, just a reminder, this next one about the time and word limit. Um, the time limit uh, can even be a little bit, uh, I don't wanna say ag aggressive, but because there's 
some people that, um, a lot of people that come for public comment, you could be cut off right in the middle of what you're saying and you will briskly be asked to step away from the mic. So um, keeping that in mind is important. Um, and lastly, it's um, kind of tradition and uh, it makes the decision makers feel nice if you just thank them for their time um, by name before you head out. So that's kind of an outline of what delivering testimony could look like. Um, and uh, we have a short video of all that in action in the next slide. Lynn, I don't think we can hear the audio. Or at least I can't. Okay, I think I just have to reshare and share the audio as well. So one second. Thanks, Lynn. Hayden and Anna from YWCA. Good morning. Um, my name is Mia Edera, and I'm the program manager at Youth Care's Hope Center. The Hope Center is a 24-7 emergency shelter for youth ages 12 to 17. Our, our program serves high-needs youth, youth who are involved in the sex trade, youth who are experiencing substance use disorder, youth who are street entrenched, and youth who have acute mental health needs in a trauma-informed way. Our shelter has 14 beds, and under state law, we're required to have one staff member for every eight youth. I've worked at the Hope Center since we opened in May of 2017. Since that time, we have never been able to fill all 14 of our beds. Not because there isn't a need, but because we are so chronically understaffed that we can never meet the ratio requirements to supervise more than eight youth at a time. The hardest positions to fill are grave staff, meaning the staff working from 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning, who are required to stay awake and check on the youth as they sleep. It has been almost impossible to keep the positions filled because the hours are so difficult and the pay is so low. We have a wonderful staff at the Hope Center. They're incredibly committed and do amazing work to help young people stabilize and build trust. But I can't get my staff to stay more than 10 months, 12 at the most. And when they leave, they all generally say the same thing, that they love the team, they love the clients, they love the work they do, they just need to make more money. Mm -hmm. it, it is one thing to have youth sleeping outside because there are no shelter beds. It's another to have youth sleeping outside, not because, there's enough, not because there aren't enough beds, but because there aren't enough staff willing to do the job. That's why this legislation is so important. When agencies cannot keep up with the cost of doing business, youth as young as 12 years old end up sleeping outside on our streets. I think I can safely assume that no one in this room would ever want a young person to face this reality. But unfortunately, that's exactly what we're doing if you don't pass this legislation. Um, on behalf of our youth and staff, I urge your support. Thank you for your time. Thank you so very much. Yeah, so as you can see, it could be very powerful to speak from lived experience in front of decision makers. Um, and unfortunately, it's not done as often um, by those who experience the, the thing that is being voted on. Um, and so that's why, personally, I'm just very passionate about sharing this information um, because it's not widely shared that this is an opportunity for the public and the community to get involved with the people um, making really important decisions about um, what goes on in our communities. Does anyone have any reflections after watching the video? I always think um, kind of two things. The first thing is um, I think it's really powerful to, to go and be able to testify and, and share your your um, position. Um, and I think I'm just kind of supporting what you just said, how usually the people that are most impacted aren't the ones that are that are there and able to do it, which um, 
I mean, it is what it is at this moment, but I feel like that's a lot of what we're trying to do in our work um, is to be able to empower, not only empower with knowledge, but in, empower with practice and confidence, um, you know, like those things, because it's it's really hard to do that. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to get up and and share, um, just publicly speak, or to even to, to have that idea that what you have to say is gonna be heard, you know, that that's such a huge gap. Um, that's, but I also feel like um, the people that are able to, it, it, it's, a, it's necessary and so powerful. Yes, thank you, Rebecca. That also makes me think about um, how one of the benefits of publicly testifying is um, kind of the healing component of being heard um, and sharing your story with others, um, hoping to make an impact and a positive impact on the world. So thank you. All right, well, I will wrap up my section. Um, Petra, Hayden, and Anna. <laughs> with this next uh, slide here. So testifying um, can be a little nerve wracking and a little bit scary as a first step into advocacy. So I wanted to present some other <laughs> alternatives. Um, so one way to participate um, that's a little bit more of a low level resource um, would be to get your position noted. Um, so on um, these different websites, um, like the Washington State one that I showed, but also um, on the city and county level, um, if you know a particular issue is being voted on or being spe uh, spoken about, you can, um, uh, there's, a, there's a section that you can go either pro or against that particular um, topic, and you can do that either either as um, uh, an individual constituent or as an organization, you can just put in your organization, um, whether it supports that um, policy or it doesn't. Um, and this, the decision makers will see that um, when they're making that decision on whether or not to go for that. Um, another thing you could do would be comment on a bill or policy. Um, so that could be, um, emailed or emailed directly to the decision maker or um, sent in via the Washington State um, website. Um, so that would be not only saying uh, your position, but maybe including a little blurb or a little, a few sentences on why you believe that. Um, and then lastly would be contacting your council members or legislators um, directly. So um, you can call them and they have, um, you know, their, interns or assistants um, kind of fielding those calls um, or leave a message. Um, so if uh, I know for me, myself, it's kind of um, difficult to know someone is going to pick up the phone, I'm going to have to talk to them. So that's a different way to um, express your opinion. Um, and then uh, you can also just email um, the different decision makers. Um, but some organizations have templates that you can send out. Um, and spam kind of picks up if multiple emails are too similar. Um, so just making sure that you're switching up your email and really including your voice um, so that it will get to the decision maker. Um, so thank you very much uh, for listening to my portion. <laughs> um, we do have another break coming up. Um, Audrey, did we, Audrey and Lynn, did we decide a five minute break? Yeah, that sounds good. All right, so we'll be back. Uh, my clock says at 429. So please do take a break. Okay, so to wrap us up, we're gonna talk about using data and advocacy. So Many of you have talked to us about other uh, or been in other data trainings, but we're going to frame uh, using data for the purposes of advocacy in the next and final section. So how can data support advocacy? Um, it can demonstrate a need. Um, it can help you articulate and strengthen an argument or really give some backing to needs you know your community faces. It can educate decision makers. Um, it can help them get more context on issues and make them feel more capable of making decisions. 
Um, you can equip decision makers to take action. So you make it easier for them to vote in the way, you, you know, take action the way you're asking them to. Ooh, sorry about that. Um, you can facilitate coalition building. So um, this is a great way to identify who is aligned with you and what else um, you might be able to accomplish together. Of course, you can inform the public and influence opinion. Uh, we talked about that a lot um, in, when we're talking about kind of grassroots lobbying and informing others about the actions you're hoping they can become informed about and take, take and care about. And finally, you can reinforce um, a narrative or back up an existing story. So data can be really powerful for doing that um, and make sure that you um, can really back up Sometimes that something will come into the public eye and um, it might just be one person's story, but data can really provide context that this might be happening a lot more. So data itself may be considered neutral. Numbers aren't particularly um, in and of themselves. They don't really take sides, but of course data has been weaponized. Data can be used in lots of different ways. On the plus side, data can also address equity. So um, it can unlock certain opportunities to, to raise that flag and to take action. So um, if we think of the goal for equity to be that race is no longer a predictor of um, life outcomes, we can imagine in this case that infant mortality in an equitable world would be equal regardless of race. Um, so these should be equal across um, all different groups of people. So this is the hope, of course, if you're trying to imagine your ideal scenario. So what are some strategies, um, some data strategies for equity? So. First, you need to make sure that um, tracking equity is possible. So ensuring that as you are tracking race and ethnicity um, in your data, that it is something that is, it, that is tracked, that is, that is asked about, so you're able to understand what is happening with your populations for your own organization or, or for other data that you might be looking for, um, or if you have some sort of influence there. You want to make sure when you're doing the analysis that you break apart your data by race and ethnicity. So you're analyzing and looking for trends broken down by different groups. You want to identify underlying causes. And so maybe you see some disparity in the data that you've analyzed. And then comes the part where you're trying to imagine why. Um, a lot of this happens a lot in your programs. A lot of your programs are set up to address some of these issues, but it can be a helpful exercise to do for your advocacy as well. And then finally, you've identified some of those rationales or ideas, what, what might be causing inequity, and those would be the things that you can frame your advocacy around. And sometimes that arc of a story or narrative can really be powerful when you're talking to decision makers or others who you're trying to get to care about whatever it is that you're advocating for. So to kind of walk through those steps, let's imagine that we work for an example organization that supposed, supports expecting and new parents. Uh, so we'll walk through some of these steps you might take. So first imagining your key organizational outcomes. Um, so that's what you're working toward for your population. Let's say you support breastfeeding with families and how you track that is by watching the rate of breastfeeding from clients. Another key outcome might be redu reducing low, weight, low birth weights or preterm births. And so to track that, you're watching that rate of low birth weights or preterm births. Maybe the third key outcome for your organization is removing cultural barriers to accessing the healthcare system. And that might be a little more nuanced. You might look at client visit numbers or client surveys to help understand what their experience is accessing the healthcare system. So we are going to focus right now on the rate of low birth weights, just as an example. So next, explore your outcome data. So as we talked about, um, we wanna look at what's going well. First, let's see where your organization is, is really succeeding. And if you look at your organization, um, you can see that from 2015 to 2019, the rate of low birth weights for your clients actually went down. So that's great. That shows good movement for your organization. 
but it's even can be even more telling to compare that with other statistics, other, other comparison data. So let's say you then look at that compared with Washington State, which you can see you are lower, you are still lower than Washington State by almost a full percent. And nationally, you're a lot lower. Go back there. So it's very helpful to frame it and understand where the story is. So even though your organization saw lower rates of uh, low birth weights, you can see that that rate actually stayed static in, your, in Washington or even increased nationally. And all of this can help you as you're trying to start imagining the story you might wanna to put together. So, okay, we've looked at the big picture, but where is there more nuance? When you break this out by race, you can see that the picture is really different. So you might see um, your organization is actually mimicking Washington state trends, even though you're doing better than Washington on average, you still see a lot of disparity when you look by uh, racial groups. So what happened there? The average just masked the story of racial inequity. So another reason why I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but yes, why you'd want to do that. So then, you know, as you're trying to come up with a plan, start brainstorming what is driving the story. So what are some potential causes of low birth weights? Um, some research has shown that low social supports can impact birth outcomes. So maybe that's one idea that you have. Um, of course, we know that financial insecur insecurities can force family decisions like the decision to keep certain jobs or you know, the food you feed yourself, all kinds of things, a lot of stress that comes with that that can result in low birth weights. And maybe environmental health concerns. So maybe you have poor living conditions. You might be living close to polluting, or polluting companies, polluting communities. Um, there might be mold in the apartment complexes that you, that you might be living in. So these are all potential ideas that could help you start forming your story of, of how you might want to advocate. So once you've got kind of some of these stories, you're gonna start thinking about how you could uh, create an advocacy plan. So let's brainstorm some advocacy goals. Since BIPOC people have higher rates of low birth weight babies, we could, and again, thinking about these different you know, areas of advocacy, at the community level, maybe you can think about how to increase social supports for expectant and pregnant people, expecting and pregnant people. Um, so since we know that social supports may impact that, uh, maybe you advocate for increasing those levels. So one example is there's a centering pregnancy program, which foundation of that program is to build in social supports or you increase that amount that you do in your organization. Um, or maybe you connect with other organizations that take that approach in order to kind of come together as a community and advocate for that approach. When you think about lobbying, you might really wanna focus on reducing, reducing financial stress for pregnant people and families. And so you might look for bills that address poverty or maybe more specifically that might have measures to increase rent forgiveness that prioritizes mothers um, expecting pregnant people, families. On the legal side, um, you know, maybe this could, thinking back to one of your ideas for your causes, if you think, you know, pollution and, and poorly resourced potentially um, situations of neighborhoods that could make people sick or unhealthy, um, you could potentially testify in a court case that might address this. So let's say there's an upcoming court case about uh, pollution that's trying to hold a company to account for a trend of low birth weights in the neighborhood. Um, that's one, you know, one example of how you might get involved on the legal side. Although you know, that might be a bit specific, but that is one way in which this broad advocacy goal could connect to lots of these different types or forms of advocacy. So then you want to imagine short, intermediate, and long-term goals. So um, again, you can't achieve the goal of, of, of addressing low birth weights right away. So you want to break it into bite-sized pieces. In this example, we'll think about lobbying. So how might we address financial supports for pregnant people and families? Um, let's imagine short-term is about three months. 
you know, to start, you could imagine what your lobbying plan might look like and organize your data to be prepared to start talking to people, decision makers, get your story ready. Um, in the intermediate term, let's say six months, you can start lobbying elected officials on expanded financial supports for pregnant people and families. Um, this, you know, depends a lot, Araceli mentioned earlier about how we're about to go into session. So of course you need to plan around that too. Um, you're not gonna be able to find people as much, find decision makers when they're not in uh, Olympia in the case of Washington state. So some of that depends on the calendar, but um, it's never too early to just kind of start imagining what that might look like. And then longer term, a year plus, um, you hope your goal is to pass financial support legislation. Might be longer than a year, as uh, we were talking about earlier, sometimes bills die, it takes time. We'll talk in a little bit just about what an advocacy window might look like, but um, long-term is that your eventual goal is to get this type of legislation passed. So, you know, just thinking about how to make that more actionable, you connect those goals to some advocacy actions for your team and, and for your organization. So um, if your goal was to prepare a lobbying plan and organize your data, your next action might be to really organize those talking points, do some additional policy research, make sure your data is aligned to tell your story and start identifying representatives. So the obvious representative is the one who represents you or your organization, but maybe that's starting to identify who else really cares about this and who else might we think to talk to um, to advance this goal. So then your intermediate goal was to lobby elected officials on expanded financial support. So how will you do that? You'll start scheduling meetings and prep advocacy one pagers, which I'll mention um, in a coming slide. And then of course, long-term, um, when we get to the part where there's actually an active bill, you'll start testifying in favor of rele relevant bills. You might energize your supporters to call and um, encourage their decision maker to vote yes on whatever bill it might be. Um, and then hopefully you get to the end and you have a bill that you've passed. But let's revisit that advocacy one pager because if you are deciding to lobby, it is a really important tool to use. It is kind of expected and it helps helps you a lot in, when you're meeting with representatives who may only have, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to give you. So what it is, and we have a little picture on the right hand side, it's a concise overview of your organization, the issue and your goals. And again, you want to be really concise. This is a great place to insert your data um, with the compelling facts either from your organization or and often put into context. Um, so comparing your organization to Washington State compared to national can help tell that story. You can use it to help facilitate meetings with legislators or staffers. So again, you're not going to have a large amount of time with these decision makers. So you want to make sure you use your time well. Um, you can use this one pager as a way to walk through um, everything you're asking, trying to inform them, um, proposing solutions, and the ask. And then the goal is you leave this behind. So they're fully equipped to, um, to make decisions or to advocate, decide that they can take a stance on a, on a bill or, or a policy issue. So lastly, I think it's really important to, Araceli was mentioning this earlier when we talk about opportunity. So, um, sometimes it's unpredictable what your opportunity is going to be and we're calling these policy windows. So a policy window is really an unpredictable opening in the policy process that may help you advance your issue. So um, there's a scholar named Kingdon who talked about these three streams that need to come together to result in a policy and changes in any of them can really help you advance your issue. So um, policy windows can open when um, we'll go through each stream, a new problem or definition of a problem occurs. So we have a great recent example in the COVID-19 pandemic. It was not anything anybody anticipated, um, but it really was a, a very compelling time that shone a light on a lot of problems that I think many of us are um, seeing worsen with children, families, um, clients we serve. Um, so it's, it is, though it's terrible, it's also potentially been a, a, 
a problem that has you know really highlighted additional needs and it could be a powerful time to address certain issues with decision makers. Other examples of problems, natural or climate disasters and economic crash. A lot of these really big shocks can open a policy window to, to advance an issue. You also have political change. That's the second part of the stream. So we, they're a bit more predictable in the sense that we know when elections occur, um, but we also know then what the time window is for certain things or if we're really trying to target a certain decision maker um, or kind of waiting for to see if a decision maker gets reelected, that that can that can matter. Um, and that part is also important because we know there's a big sea change that can happen with any election. And then finally, a promising policy solution is um, something that can kind of be that third part of the stream. So it can be a promising solution to address issues. Uh, potentially it could be new evidence. So this could be a policy solution that has worked somewhere else. It could be a great blueprint for taking and suggesting for our communities. Um, and so it's useful to be watching for those things um, if you're focused on a particular issue. I think the main thing to, to think about when it comes to policy windows is that you can't predict when they're going to open, but you can prepare for them. So as we were just talking about organizing our data and thinking about how we talk about problems, um, that is one thing you can always be doing, not only to advocate with funders, but just to always understand the issues facing your community. And then you can always be sort of building those relationships with partners, um, identifying decision makers if it comes to that, if you're kind of pursuing a lobbying approach to advocacy. Um, and then, you know, hopefully when a new problem or, you know, issue arises that would open that window, you're ready. You've made those relationships, you've got data, you kind of know what the story is, and you're in a good position to say, okay, great, this is, this is something we can jump into. Um, but yes, unfortunately, no crystal balls. Um, so we're kind of at the end here, and I, I guess before we ask our, our last wrap up, I'm wondering if anyone has any reflections or questions about thinking about how they might use data in advocacy. All right, then I'm going to ask you my last question, which is, we don't have to get right to you know legislation and we can think about ways we might start small um and some of you may already be involved in advocacy um so what is one way that you could get involved in advocacy or expand your advocacy if it's something you're already doing i don't know if anyone has ideas but i feel like it would be great to to hear what those are And maybe while you're thinking, um, let's see. Uh, we could drop the eval link in the chat just so folks have a chance to open that in their browser before they may have to leave. Thanks, Araceli. Great, I see a comment that, um, that you're already involved, Adja, but you're still figuring out the legislative part. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, There's a lot of moving pieces and it's, it can take a minute to kind of think through where it makes sense to engage or the next step. But actually the fact that you're figuring out the legislative part is a great step and that's gonna be really important. Um, I think another way is kind of how you guys showed us that little video of the live testimony. If there are issues that are affecting your community or your organization, I think it's a good way to log on and just watch others give their testimony because then that gives you an idea of how to craft and package your message like um, what it looks and feels like how it looks to sign in and wait because um, I'm also currently involved in that so I've, I've, I've logged on and given testimony a, a few times now but it's a lot to it right it's not just like preparing your thing and saying it you have to like how they refer to you, what it looks like when things are happening, because that could all be distracting if you're not familiar. So I would say just kind of joining, joining other um, hearings and just seeing how they look. Yeah, that's a great su suggestion, Rebecca. I feel like too, you noted something about like making sure you've budgeted the time for it, because I know you can wait for a long time um, 
for to be able to have your testimony heard, but all, all of the exposure can help you feel more comfortable in the process. That's awesome to hear you're already kind of in there and doing that. And thanks for sharing, Jamie. It sounds like you'd love to work towards sharing the legislative parts with families um, or collaboration with orgs that do. Um, yeah, and I agree, the bills are very overwhelming to understand. And so in some ways, organizations can be like a conduit in terms of that kind of community or um, grassroots organizing to just help people feel like they have a voice and some agency and a little understanding in the process. So love that. Awesome. Well, these are such great ideas. Um, thank you all for sharing. So yeah, let us know how it goes. We'd love to hear from you as you advocate alongside your communities. Um, and if we can help, if we can help you organize your data or think through some strategies to be ready for that kind of thing, just absolutely let us know. Um, and finally, if you are able to open the evaluation link that Araceli has dropped in the chat, um, we would love to hear from you about how we can continue to make trainings that matter and can support you. We're just actually right in the process of thinking of our 2022 training. So we'd absolutely love to hear about this train, your feedback on this training and any other suggestions for topics you might find helpful. And then finally, um, please do feel free to access our Empower tools at this link. Um, honestly, I just dropped that in the chat for us as well. Um, so we have a suite of Empower tools around advocacy and of course other topics as well. So I encourage you to check those out at any time from our website. Um, and so now we welcome any questions. Um, if you have anything lingering, um, otherwise, it has been just such a pleasure spending this afternoon with all of you, but we'll stick around um, if any of you want to chat about any other advocacy items. But otherwise, on behalf of our team, Araceli, Lynn, and myself, um, we just so appreciate your time and contributions. It's great to hear what you're doing out there and we can't wait to follow along. Thank you so much. Thank you, see you around. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Until next time. Thank you. Yeah, see ya. <laughs> we did it. Bye.